Welcome back. Uh, in our first story, Ghana has been selected out of 17 countries in Africa by the Education Commission, a global initiative encouraging progress on Sustainable Development Goal 4 to carry out a project aimed at improving the educational sector. This was informed by the challenges that emerged during the COVID-19 pandemic. Policy dialogue engagements have therefore commenced to solicit ideas from stakeholders in the sector. My colleague Samuel uh, has details in the following report. The Education Ministry is collaborating with the Institute for Educational Planning and Administration, IEPA, with support from the Education Commission on an inclusive, engaging and adaptive innovative pedagogy project. Leader of the project, Dr. Sam Eruku, after a policy dialogue workshop told Joy News the objective is to ensure that no learner is left behind in education, regardless of location. We need to make sure that education that is provided is inclusive, is adaptive, and is engaging so that no learner is left behind. Actually, the intention is that education should be meeting the children where they are in terms of physical location, in terms of ability. And as a result of that, the Education Commission, working with uh, government, identified uh, 17 uh, countries. And from the 17 countries, narrowed down to seven, and finally to three countries where Education Commission want to engage government to understand the extent to which these pedagogies are being implemented and to understand the success stories and then understand the gaps that exist. And then Education Commission will work with partners in the country to be able to close those gaps. So at the moment, Ghana has been selected as one of those countries. Rwanda is the second one and Kenya is the second one. We're not focusing on all the spectrum of education sector, we are focusing, focusing on the primary school, 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 uh, school level. At the end of it, the researchers will go back into the field, collect additional data, and then they will come back, have a second policy dialogue, share the lessons they've gathered with wider stakeholders, which include politicians, like, uh, members of parliament, assemblymen, parents, and then finally produce a country brief and then an action plan. The IEPA has been contracted by the Education Commission to conduct research on innovative pedagogies and create greater awareness in Ghana. Data General of the IEPA, Dr. Michael Boachi Yadom, explained that a stakeholder policy dialogue is to understand the status quo and make the necessary interventions. Uh, we know that it's not every school child who is successful. We want every school child to be successful. Is it about the way we teach? Um, again, capacity strengthening happens all the time. We are not, um, we don't want to stay at the same place. We want to change, we want to get better, we want to enhance our skills. So one, this is to understand what the status quo is and also put in some interventions to make us better. And then one thing is clear, that innovative pedagogy works. Innovative pedagogy uh, to a large extent uh, leads to uh, school improvement, it leads to better student outcomes, it makes students understand things better, and then it helps us to achieve equity in education. Meanwhile, a pedagogical assessment expert, Professor Eric Anane, highlighted the need to meet global educational standards. The world is rapidly moving or changing, and COVID-19 has given us indication as to the fact that we need to move fast in our school system and in our communities to make sure that we catch up on how we educate our citizenry. So we need to change the ways that we do things as COVID-19 came in to show us that the way we teach, the way we engage our learners in their learning processes and the material we engage them in, we need to have a real look at them so that we can teach them competencies and skills that will help them to thrive in the ever-changing world. The policy dialogue with key stakeholders in the educational sector for self-assessment is one of the deliverables by IEPA that will lead to a nationwide rapid data gathering and analysis. Samuel Embrace report for Joy News. Let's shift our attention now to the Asin North controversy as some legal practitioners are questioning the Supreme Court's verdict on the Asin North MP's case. 
The Supreme Court yesterday ruled that Jachi Kwesen should stop performing parliamentary duties until the determination of the case in connection with his election as the substantive MP for Asin North. This means, until then, the people of Asin North would have no representation in Parliament. But speaking on PM Express last night with Evans Mensah, CDD fellow Professor Stephen Kweku Asari says there is a lot or there are a lot of procedural confusions uh, in the judgment. According to him, the Cape Coast High Court had no basis for granting the injunction which had been enforced by the Supreme Court. And on this is uh, there's a lot of procedural confusion in the judgment uh, because uh, remember why there is this injunction. There is this injunction because the plaintiff has issued a writ at the Supreme Court asking for the interpretation of Article 94-2A. The plaintiff is saying he doesn't understand Article 94-2A and so the Supreme Court should help him understand that. By the way, that's for mere mortals. That's for mere mortals. The 92, 94-2A simply says you can't be a member of parliament if you are a dual citizen. No. Sorry. If you owe allegiance. If you owe allegiance, if you owe allegiance to another country. To another it doesn't country. just yes. say that. If it, if it just said that and it was understood, the plaintiff would not be in court. The plaintiff issued a writ. And if you want, read the release that the plaintiff is seeking in that writ. Justice Doji, as well as Justice uh, Amegache, recite the release that the plaintiff is seeking. The plaintiff is saying, I don't understand Article 94 to A. Mm. So court, help me understand it. But there's a judge somewhere in Cape Coast who has interpreted Article 94 to A and told the plaintiff, Hey, plaintiff, I'm going to grant you all your reliefs. And the Supreme Court is sitting there saying, well, yes, we don't understand Article 94 2 a and we are going to interpret it. But meanwhile, we think it is okay for some high court judge not only to interpret it, but to issue and grant injunctions setting aside the wishes of voters when there is a law that, look, voters' decisions must be treated with the highest level of deference yes. and they are not to be set aside. Well, speaking on the same show, legal practitioner Eduji Tamaklo questioned what he described as an enforcement of a high court ruling by the Supreme Court. Obtain a judgment in the high court and someone decide to be in contempt of that decision of the high court, your result is to issue a writ at the Supreme Court to restrain that person from that contemptuous conduct. But it's a substantive matter. No, no, but listen, if you read the ruling, obviously by the majority, uttered by his Lordship Justice Kulendi, you will notice that the decision is predicated not on the substantive rates, but the matter that is before or has been decided by July 2021. And that is why if you look at the dissenting opinion, her ladyship, Agnes Doji GSC, makes the point that it appears what has happened is an academic exercise. Because it is just unheard of that a high court gives you judgment. And as recounted by the learned deputy attorney general, there was no subsistence appeal. There was no stay of execution. So what it means is that you have a judgment. Now, if you have a high court judgment, do you go to the Supreme Court to have it enforced? No. And I want to believe that, even in his practice, many years practice as a lawyer, he had never approached the Supreme Court to enforce a high court judgment for him. But let's clarify. No, two. That's not why they went to the Supreme Court. No, they went no, to the Supreme no. Court for a substantive no, that is what Article I, no, 94. But I'm saying a. that. And it's in that cause that they said, okay, whilst no, you no. determine this injunct. No. The Supreme Court today, and if you read hmm. the majority decision, 
His Lordship Justice Kulendi does not proceed on the basis of the alleged constitutional breaches, but takes the view that the plaintiff is alleging that the continual stay of the MP having a judgment obtained against him is contemptuous and that that should not be permitted. And that is why if you look at what my Lord Justice Nenamegache stated, he said, look, this level of legal ingenuity should not be permitted. Well, speaking with me earlier on the AM show, lawyer Justice Abdullah observed that the ruling uh, injures the interest of the people of Asin North. He argued that in principle, Mr. Jachikwesen had been elected by the people to represent them in parliament and should not be denied that opportunity unless or until such time uh, the court has determined the outcome of the election petition before it. Mm, a review application for me, um, you do it on the, matter, um, on the basis of principle, not because you think the Supreme Court is necessarily wrong, because really, um, as we all know, including my own case, which I, I may not be able to bring out now, a review is a very difficult thing to do, and, and, and in addition to the fact, particularly when, in fact, sometimes, uh, just sometimes, even where the Supreme Court was palpably wrong, they will still refuse to grant a review application. However, on principle, it would be better to apply for a review um, just so, just so, if you, if there, because, because of that small room of opportunity that you probably could have explored to tilt the balance. And if that room still exists, and in this particular case it exists for the Member of Parliament, I will strongly urge his legal team, and I know I trust the members of his legal team, that if, if they believe in their case, I will strongly urge them to do it. Even if they don't believe in their case, and they, they are now ground for them to apply for review, I will strongly urge them to do so because of the interest of the nation, not particularly because of the interest of that Member of Parliament, but because of the interest of the nation. On the substantive issue, uh, could we see a, 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 a divergence in terms of opinion, in terms of the constitutionality of, of uh, you know, uh, holding his office on the back of how things have gone? Very briefly, so I come back into the studio to Roxon. Well, that I may not be competent to advise uh, because, really, um, he, he has a lot of senior lawyers and uh, in the likes of the I mean, Roxon is himself there, among others. Um, I think they, they are better placed to, to expect what, is, uh, what they have against them, and they know what to do better. But right. also when they have the full facts of the case before them, so they, they know better what to do and how, how not to do what they want to do. Um, and also, of course, they understand the political implications of everything they do. But I would always think that we should look at the, in, um, the, the interests of the nation in making some of these decisions, and not to leave any stone unturned in the pursuit of justice. All right. Justice Abdullah. Let's turn our gaze now to our living standards. They are skilled laborers who go to the Kumasi Labor Department every day to wait for people who require their services. For a day's work, most of these casual construction workers receive between 80 and 120 CDs. But with a rising cost of building materials, construction work has slowed down. In our Living Standards series today, Nanai Aljima spends the morning uh, with workers and files this report. This early morning, the streets of Asafo are yet to come alive. Offices and shops in the area remain closed, but the frontage of the Kumasi Labor Office is full of casual construction workers who come here daily, awaiting patronage of their services. Labor Office, you know, we have been here one week for one week. We have been here one week for one week. Sometimes we can spend a week here without getting a job. If you are lucky, you can get to work for the whole week. One week. Wow, but the human and quite 
Alhaji is a popular steel bender. He is also skilled in painting and provides any of the services as demanded. Alhaji left a construction company over a decade ago to hawk his services on the streets. In the past weeks, he managed to access services for two days in a week. This earned him 200 cities to cater for himself, two wives and six children. My wives are working, but I am the one taking care of all of them. I have a family in the north who call whenever there is an emergency and I have to respond. Amos Boache has been frequenting the labor office for over 20 years. The past weeks have been tough. He can only access a day of service in the week. Meanwhile, his transportation fare to the labor office has increased from 6 to 10 cities daily. He has had to be strategic in his spending on food to save some money to take care of the home. We have to be cautious with our spending because you are uncertain about when you get your next job. Some of us can't even feed ourselves. We depend on God. John Mensah has been engaged once for his carpentry services in the week. This earned him 120 cities. Surviving on the amount has been tough for him. He is hoping for an additional 20 cities to make up for the increase in transportation costs. As I said, you pay cut your phone, you pay one point four ID. As a missing phone, a more than one point three. No, send a corner. We want an increase in our charges. At least one forty Ghana cities for carpentry work is fine. Sometimes we are forced to take old charges because the customers are not ready for the new prices. The men prefer hawking their services on the streets to employment in construction firms, but the streets are increasingly turning expensive. With a persistent increase in commodity prices, these construction workers would love to increase the service charge, but the fear is that their services may no longer be patronized by the populace. For joining us, Nana Yaojima, Kumasi. And that was our Living Standard Series for today. Now, though Ghana is among the four countries in Africa with the most stringent fire preventive measures, unfortunately, 80% of facilities don't have a fire detection system. This is largely because they rely on the internet to report. But what if there's a fire detection device that can detect fire and report the facility uh, owner without the internet? That's what Tech Device Hub Limited has done with a smart fire detection device. On Tech Thursday, Love FM's Chrissy Debra speaks with the KNUSD graduates Stephen Frimpong and Jesse Enim. And that the top four African countries with the most stringent fire preventive measures, even though 80% of buildings in Ghana here don't have fire detection systems, 
This means that it's worse in other African countries, and there need to be a way out. Why are people not using fire detection systems in Africa yet? Because the available ones are imported, and they don't have certain features that suit our system. What are these features? We talk about a system that reports with internet in a continent where there is poor internet infrastructure. What else? A system that needs people's presence. This is not so in Africa here. Unfortunately, there is poor internet infrastructure. And then people can't afford to employ people who oversee their places when they are not there. So the smart fire alert from Tech Device Out is designed to be the best fit for our African market. And as such, ensure that in the next coming years, most African houses have fire detection system that suit the environment. It is able to detect fire, and when it detects it like any fire detection device, it reports to the facility owner and the fire service without internet, meaning it doesn't rely on internet to report, solving the problem of poor internet infrastructure. What else does it do? With its ability to report automatically, you don't need to employ someone to oversee the place when there is fire detected because it is able to do that by itself. This makes the smart fire alert a game changer in the African market, not to talk of the backup power source, which is able to power the system when there is no power because in Africa here, there is unreliable power. Uh, interesting one there. Now, the medical director of the Afian Kwanta Regional Hospital, Joseph Kojo Tambil, says the hospital has lodged a complaint at the Takrade District Police Station over allegations of a missing or stolen baby leveled against staff of the hospital. The family of a 14-year-old GHS student uh, who allegedly delivered prematurely at the facility says the hospital has failed uh, to give them access to the body of the baby who was declared dead barely 24 hours after delivery. The incident happened, and the mother of the teenager, who only gives her name as Gifty, wants the matter investigated. We went to the sawmill, but upon arrival, we were told she was in labor. And since they didn't have an incubator, we moved to a fear in Guanta hospital accompanied by a nurse. My, My 15-year-old pregnant daughter, who had entered her seventh month, gave birth, and the child was put in an incubator. After visiting the baby twice, I left the hospital, only to return the next morning, and to be told that the child had died. When I demanded to see the corpse, I was told I had to wait for a morgue assistant, who never showed up. I returned to the Six months to seven. Six months to seven. Uh -huh. I don't know. I can or the hospital. Oh, I'm what you receive is not to a train. Now, uh, the, uh, my card is not to a card. Card is Okay, I then not know my true card. I only know you the crystal bell. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Time more, 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 Let me say I cry no one. I know I say more to my number by final coin or by my number and walk with them and I'm seeing. I feel my china wama maybe me cross our baby. In the third and a son, no me or more me no more down and I'm cut on the ah. Nice me the oil and the ask you. What I cry walk around me and walk around. No more talk on or I cry away in body or some bay and who ye. If you are my miss our baby and baby and nursing in one or man won't walk around the thing. But now, we're banned in the hospital. Ah, I mean, you need to buy. You need to buy. Curious, uh, but the regional hospital has denied the allegations. Here's an interview with the medical director of the Afian Kwanta Regional Hospital, Joseph Kojo Tambil. He spoke to my colleague, Ernest Maynard, last night. Um, she came on the first to deliver. I only got aware of this issue on the 12th of March at around 10 p.m. when she had gone to a radio station to make damning allegations against staff. Did the baby die yeah. at the facility? Absolutely, yes. That's, that's, Was that, the baby that's buried thereafter? Yes. And you see, when the baby passed, and, and the baby passed um, a little over three hours after it was expelled. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this was a baby that weighed 0 0.5 kilograms. And the estimated gestational age was 24 weeks by the specialist pediatrician. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this baby's chance of survival was all right at the beginning, was less than 50%. Okay, now this woman leaves the hospital and for three days she wasn't found. She was asked to go and do um, the records for the baby. Mind you, there were two people here. The, uh, her daughter, who is the mother of this fetus we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the teenager. Yeah. Uh, yes, and the fetus itself. So she was asked to go and make records for the well, she never did. She never did. She never went back to the Niku. Well, she disputes this. She says that she actually yeah. saw the baby yeah. being put in an that incubator. Why, she went home to and came back the next day, the next day, only to be told that the baby had died. And upon yeah. request, yeah. because she wanted to see the body of the baby, she was told she had to pay some money uh, for those in charge of the mortuary to lead her there. Is that indeed the case? Well, is that what happened? I, I, like I told you, I, all these things, like I told you, the story keeps changing. And I'm, I'm actually I'm wondering what the motive is. I'm wondering what she wants. What? Because when they came to my office, okay, I sat down and negotiate with hospital. And I was asking them, what are we negotiating about? The when you say when you say they wanted to negotiate, what were their demands? But they're asking us to compensate the little girl for the loss of her child. Well, I, I put that question to her, and she denied that. But, but very quickly, no. Doc, where, where yeah. was the baby buried? In, within the premises of the hospital. And the person who did it is alive and well. Mm. And so at any point... Uh, if push comes to shove, the body can be exhumed, DNA analysis can be done. You see... But is it, is it standard practice to go ahead to bury anybody at all uh, without the consent of the family? Well, that is an issue to be interrogated later. But, okay, but, but you are the professional. I mean, you, you are superintendent of the hospital. Does it ever happen? as part of your operations, is it standard that at any point in time you have the right to go ahead to bury anybody uh, because of whatever circumstance? 
No, we have a standard procedure with regards to adults. I think there's a little bit of a lacuna when it comes to uh, 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 preterm fetuses at, at that age because they're so tiny and um, it's difficult to keep them in a warm fridge. Mm, but, but but even if the procedure isn't clear with babies, isn't it yeah. out? Isn't it just curious because it's 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 a, it's a human yes, life you're talking yes. about here that the family is yes. indeed informed. They know where the baby yes. is buried, and then there's a yes. proper closure. Absolutely, you are absolutely right, and I'm not. I won't hold brief for any staff who may have breached any standard procedures. I won't do that. But you see, this matter could have been laid to rest right from the beginning. Mm. But but I'm interested in knowing who ordered for the baby to be buried. Did the well, nurses take? Like I said, the police is handling this matter, and we will get to know who did what, okay? Um, but suffice it to say that no baby uh, was missing, no baby okay. was lost where the baby is, okay. in the that it is. And, and just and finally, uh, since you reported this to the police, has there been any yeah. invitation or interrogation of your staff uh, that you're aware of? Yes, yes. How many? Um, um uh, well i can't i can't give those details but uh i know the police are in touch with staff uh they, they they've gone to the police station several times um so they are on it well several attempts to get the police on the matter have uh, failed Let's talk education now. And pupils of the Wantugu Tunteya uh, Primary, uh, located in the northern region, are not happy to be sitting the same exam with pupils from well endowed schools. 12 year old Napare Suleiman could not hide her frustration about the phenomenon when she spoke with our northern regional correspondent on the poor state of her school. Martina Bugri tells the story of how the Wantugu uh, Tunteya Primary is housed under two trees in that community. You know those who sit in class and we those who sit on the trees cannot be the same. When the sun comes up, we run home and they sit in their classrooms to learn. So when we meet to write exams, they will pass better than us. This is Napari Sulemana, a primary five pupil of the Wantugu Tumteya Primary School. He is one of the 193 children from the school who have big dreams of becoming nurses, teachers, among other professions. But it comes with challenges each day where the weather determines whether you can fulfill your dream. The sun directly falls on us with the heat, making us not able to learn. So we are forced to run home. We close at 1.30 p.m., but we go home before the time because of the weather. Whenever it rains, we are forced to go home because there's no classroom. And if we return after the rain, the place will be wet and we can't sit down. Meanwhile, our colleagues in other schools with structures are learning. School infrastructure plays a critical role in determining the quality of learning. But that cannot be said of rural communities who solely depend on government schools, which sometimes come with classrooms in a peaceful state or in some cases no classroom. One to go to Mteya Primary School is one of such schools. Established in 2009 by a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer, Anna Fred, it was to teach children the basics so that they can be able to grasp and join the upper primary. It was later absorbed by the Ghana Education Service in 2013. But since the takeover, the school is yet to receive just a single infrastructure. The assemblyman for the area, Isahaku Abdul Karim, said his predecessor had written several letters to the assembly for help. That is yet to yield any result, other than that, he has also written to the assembly. Uh, I uh, wrote a letter to the DC and I was not getting response, so I later asked the PTA and the SMC chairman for to go and meet the DC personally. 
So when we went and met him, the DC uh, had meted us and he directed me to rewrite another letter. The district chief executive for Tolong, Hussein Salifu Isi Fumosi, has assured that the school will receive the attention it deserves when the assembly's budget is approved. I made sure that uh, that school was being captured in that composite budget so that when the budget is approved for us, we will be in a position to put up a better classroom accommodation for them. In any case, sometimes uh, we have other projects that might come on our way, which is not directly under our composite budget. So I have it in mind that if we have any early project outside the composite budget, I will make sure that uh, uh, we we'll go to the place and put a, a befitting classroom for them. These children are supposed to have the basics and go up to the upper primary to write the final examination with their colleagues in well-endowed schools. The question they've been posing is how will they be able to cope when they get there. For Joy News, Martina Bugri reports. Now, scientists at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology have confirmed the presence of a probable cancer-causing substance known as acrylamide in 100% of samples of bread analyzed. The lead scientist and head of the Department of Food Science and Technology, Professor Isaac Williams of Fusu, said the substance was relatively everywhere and could be found in heat-treated foods, including potato chips, some breakfast cereals, biscuits, and roasted and fried foods. Medical correspondent Dr. Netta Pasram now reports. Acrylamide was first detected in foods sampled in Sweden in 2002. This substance has the potential to cause cancer. Also, it affects the brain and other parts of the nervous system. Acrylamide forms from the three major components of food. Here we are talking about carbohydrates, then we are talking about proteins, then we are also talking about uh, fats and oils. Acrylamide can form from each one of them. Okay, um, Not to take you too deep, carbohydrate alone, when you heat carbohydrate alone, indeed acrylamide can generate from it. The present study sought to determine the exposure and health risks red pose to regular consumers. We found that um, all these indicators were below the recommended thresholds, meaning that we have to educate our people. We have to, we have to police our bakeries so that they will do the right things. Um, by simply changing the condition, by changing the conditions of uh, processing, heating time and temperature, we are able to also manage the levels of these acrylamide levels that can be found in food. The truth of the matter is that as far as cancer risk is concerned, there is zero tolerance. But for practicality, uh, risks say that the values are very low in the region of uh, greater or less than one in one million. If we, if we say we have one in say 10 million, hallelujah, it will be very nice for us. So all we need to do is to manipulate time and temperature to bring the levels of acrylamide information that can be formed as low as possible. Now, uh, the lead scientist and head of Department of Food Science and Technology, Professor Isaac Williams of Fosu, joins us live with more on this finding. Uh, Prof, thank you for joining. Now, this appears to be scary. Does that mean we should stop eating bread altogether? Not at all. Um, I've explained the uh, issue about risk several times. And um, um, there are other confounding factors that would have to be in place. And then you can... Um, begin to show mild to severe signs of, of these adverse effects. It is, the, the risk is just like traveling from here to Accra, for instance. There are risks along the line, isn't it? But then we do go there and come back by the grace of God every day. It doesn't mean that once we get into a car, then it means that 
uh, you are going to suffer any adverse effect. So uh, there are other confounding factors, things that are uncertain factors that hasn't um, or that are not clear uh, to be impacting adversely together with the presence of this acrylamide so that the final uh, response is shown. It doesn't mean that at all. We will continue to eat. And uh, once we are also uh, doing very well by eating balanced diet and so on and so forth, I think up to a certain level, our body has the capability to handle these adverse effects as well. What should we be looking out for in terms of signs or symptoms uh, to point to any acry acrylamide, you know, uh, poisoning yeah. or any so, contamination? Right. Neurologically, you have uh, these uh, neurological signs. Uh, all the things that are uh, connected with numbness and so on and so forth. And uh, as for the signs of cancer, uh, uh, it's, it's all over. And uh, uh, that's good. But then, the neurological aspect, numbness is one. And they're very typical. How do we then deal with this uh, threat, maybe even an existential threat, because we all consume bread? Yes. Uh, my advice is that um, in some other places, uh, it is nearing the, the process is nearing up for legal backing mm. uh, to control the presence of these uh, uh, adverse substances in food. But here in Ghana, we, we, we haven't reached there yet. Right. Uh, what I would suggest is that there are ways of controlling these. Uh, we have found out that cereal, the brand, the brand has high levels of these uh, 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 precursors, if you like. Well, precursors is amino acid asparagus. And there are also enzymes that are in place to break down these uh, uh, amino acids so that they don't initiate the reaction that eventually lead to uh, acrylamide in food. Mm. Uh, my final bit to you, Prof. So in the interim, uh, legally speaking, or in terms of our food safety authorities, what would you proffer that we start doing? In the interim, you say we've not advanced like other countries have, but what can we do now, in the here and now? Well, um, at the moment, we, we keep things low. Uh, too much of everything is bad, as they say. So we will continue to eat, but we are also bringing this to the fore so that we know that these things are around, and then you have to be very cautious in the way we uh, recognize and consume this food because uh, uh, the, the, the threat is lurking out there, isn't it? Prof, uh, thank you so much for engaging us and, and sharing these uh, nuggets uh, with us. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, th that was a bit uh, by way of information there. We take a break now and return with business. Hello, good morning. Welcome to Business here on News Desk. My name is Beverly Broom. The Public Interest and Accountability Committee, PIAC, has advised the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation to stop giving out loans and grants to government and government institutions until it recovers several millions of cities credit that has gone bad. This is one of the recommendations in the 2021 Annual Report on Management of Petroleum Revenue in Ghana by the statutory body. Here is a report. GNPC recorded a loss of 1.6 billion CDs in 2020, according to the 2020 State Ownership Report. Presenting the highlights of the launch of the 2021 Annual Report, Chairman of PIAC, Professor Kwame Adum Frempon, called on GMPC to double up efforts in recovering loans to government and its agencies to ensure that the corporation's work program does not suffer from non-implementation. PIAC, as part of its recommendation, also urged the Ministry of Finance, in collaboration with relevant institutions, to develop appropriate guidelines on the utilization and reporting of the annual budget funding amount disbursed to the District Assembly Common Fund. From GMPC to double up efforts to recovering loans and guarantee to government and its agencies to ensure that the cooperation work program does not suffer from non-implementation. 
For now, EMPC should discontinue granting loans and guarantees until significant recoveries are made with respect to outstanding loans and guarantee owed by the corporation. The Exim Bank has urged companies in the Volta region to leverage the varied opportunities of the financial institution to expand their business. The bank made known its readiness to support any company that would exhibit competence and commitment in producing non-traditional product for export. The Exim Bank was established by the Ghana Export Import Bank Act 2016, Act 911 to play a pivotal role in the development of Ghana's export trade. The financial institution cushions indigenous Ghanaian companies into non-traditional products to produce for exports in a bid to transform Ghana's economy into an export one. In view of this, the bank engaged the business community, policy implementers, opinion leaders in the Volta region to enlighten them on its operations. Nana Acha Obin Adia is the Exim Bank Deputy CEO in charge of banking. In line with the government's drive to make Ghana an industrial hub and to have an export-driven economy, the Ghana Exim Bank has provided funding to some established companies in the region in areas such as cereal and legume production, cassava production and wood processing. This is to enable them boost production to meet the needs of the people as well as increase exports to rake in the much needed foreign exchange for the growth of the economy. The aim of our visit today to create awareness about the projects being financed by the bank and get feedback on how best to support the Volta region. In conclusion, we strongly believe that these engagements will inform the bank to realign its support towards the development and promotion of the unearth non-traditional exports in the Volta region. The Volta Regional Minister, Dr. Achibod Lecha, implored the participants to take advantage of the varied opportunities to expand their businesses. I think we are very much interested in the exports because our country needs foreign exchange. We need our city to be strong. So we need more foreign exchange. And I know that there are businesses in Volta region that will take advantage of these facilities. But many of us don't know. Uh, but the good news is that many of our businesses have ben benefited from, uh, from these facilities. Many people who got to know have taken advantage. So the rest of us who don't know can also take advantage uh, of, of this. So that is why we are here, because uh, their emphasis is on local economic development. And uh, we've, uh, I see the uh, VDA people around. Uh, AGI, uh, Ghana Tourism Authority, they have partnered the Volta Region Community Council to organize the first. Our trade investment for 2019 was very successful. 2021 was highly successful. And we saw the, the, the things that our people were able to produce. Some of them, with a little help of 50,000, 100,000, who, who produce a lot. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, who...